Let me fix this, everyone. Welcome to First Foods. Um, my name is Desiree. I'm a two spirit that lives here in occupied Arapaho territory in Colorado. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, the program director for First Foods, and I am a Taino mother living in New York City and the Nittinicoc territories. And just welcoming everybody back again this week for our panel. So our panel today is about our access, um, I'm sorry, our relationship to the earth around access and ethical consumption. So we have some wonderful panelists here, which you may remember from our past classes this month. We have instructor James Kubasa, instructor Arlene no, no. Sid Whiting, also an instructor, and instructor Josephine A. Smith. So we have a wonderful lineup of people who just have so much to share and offer this class. So we welcome everyone um, to First Foods uh, and want to thank our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the support to make it happen. We will start um, just with some introductions. Uh, Josephine, would you mind going first and please tell us where you're at and um, maybe a little bit about yourself. Uh, Akwe, um, hello, I'm Josephine Smith. I'm living on the Shinnecock Territory. Um, we're located on the east end of Long Island, New York, um, surrounded by the Hamptons. Um, <laughs> we are Peninsula, the territory that we are living on. Um, so we have access to the lots of uh, seafood, fish, and lots of berries, deer, um, all the traditional foods that our people have been eating for hundreds and thousands of years we have here. So um, mm -hmm. I am the cultural resources director for the Shinnecock Nation. And I also, um, on my own business, I was a food vendor at powwows for more than 20 years, um, trying to do foods that um, bringing back some of the foods, not just the unhealthy, good tasting fried bread, but other foods, <laughs> giving the alternatives to, to the foods and, and using some of our traditional soups, uh, maybe with the corn and beans or succotash or samp. Um, so, and incorporating berries and all with what um, I prepare. So this is something that um, I've always enjoyed doing and tried to help teach people and, and uh, share, share knowledge that has been passed on to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Josephine. Um, Arlene, would you go next, please? Sure. I am from Sulaco, Ontario, and I am Oji Cree from um, originally from Deer Lake and now from a place called Wawagabuan. Um, we live in the boreal forest of northwestern Ontario. So we have about eight months out of the year where there's snow on the ground or six. Or I can't remember, it, it tends to vary. But anyway, what I do is I have learned a lot from my grandmothers about how we harvest our foods from the land and what we need to do with those foods when we harvest mm -hmm. them. And that varies from um, the game, the fish, the berries, the medicines, because everything we have is medicine. And <laughs> I, I just love being on the land doing those kinds of things. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Sid, would you go next, please? Oh, Mendakiafi, Sid Whiting, Imichiafi. Hello, relatives. My name is Sid Whiting. I'm Sing Changu Lakota from South Central South Dakota, the Rosebud Sioux Reservation. I'm currently living in Denver, Colorado. <clears throat> and uh, I guess what interests me the most about um, indigenous foods is the wild game aspects, the, the eating of our tatanka, our buffalo. Um, I have better access than most to buffalo or bison. Uh, and I'm an avid hunter who 
hunts every year for wild game as, such as elk, deer, antelope, and uh, small uh, game. But I believe uh, that a lot of us who live in these urban areas have uh, very difficult times acquiring uh, substance of our choice. We end up having to basically go outside the norm to acquire some of the foods that um, we look to um, indulge in. And I say indulge in is because it's, it's very seldom do we get to eat our indigenous foods. And that's a very big concern for me. Um, but uh, I'm here to uh, um, <clears throat> raise the awareness on some of the things that we might be able to do to acquire these food sources, such as investing in a buffalo ranch or even even investing in gardens, uh, community gardens. Pilamia, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. James, would you like to go? Hello, everyone. My name is James Calabasa. I live here in Colorado on the traditional homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and the Ute. I am originally from Santo Domingo Pueblo, one part of, one of the 19 pueblos that are located in New Mexico. I have been living in Colorado for close to 10 years now, you know, going to school here and working for a nonprofit called Trees, Water, and People. We do, the organization I work for, we do a lot of empowerment and facilitation to support tribes, you know, in the, the protection, preservation of their natural resources. You know, we, we value the, the traditional, the traditional knowledge and the traditional homelands that these, that our, our ancestors and our relatives live on. And that's something that we, we really thrive for, you know, for the continuation of of the knowledge and the language to be passed on from generation to generation because our ancestors have lived and protected these lands you know for, for for centuries you know way before settlers and conquerors conquistadors got here so i am really fortunate to be part of an awesome organization and also really fortunate to be part of the first foods program i myself grew up in a farming community my family you know i am I would say uh, 11th to 12th generation Pueblo farmer. We do a lot of dry land farming, such as the traditional corn, squash, beans, melons, chili, you know, such a diverse group of, of vegetables and fruits, you know, just to feed our people, you know, but also be able to hone our creativity and really honor our ancestors for how they used to live in the past, but also try to educate the younger generations and the outside world, you know, how our ancestors were able to survive off the land. So I'm very thankful and fortunate to be here with you all this evening. All right, thank you so much. Um, so we have a number of panelists on here because Joe, uh, this month just has had uh, a long month um, and we've learned so much this this month from all the instructors on this class and so we designed this panel um, to really talk about our relationship with the earth and to the earth and also to talk about things like ethical consumption and to really look at the ways in which we are approaching things like gathering and to learn about some things that we can be doing when we're out gathering that aren't always about just taking, right? I think a lot of times people think they're, oh, I'm gonna go out forage, I'm gonna find all of these things, but it really is such a give and take relationship that we're engaging with the earth um, and with the plants. So um, Brooke, I don't know if you wanted to jump in, otherwise I'll just start off with questions for our panel because you know, I've got a bunch lined up, I'm ready. No, just thanking all of them for coming back. Um, I enjoyed every one of, the, of their lectures and learned a lot myself. And it's just really an honor to be here again with you all and, and to be able to share the same space and discuss uh, our topics for today. 
Okay, so we will um, start with a question for Josephine. Um, access can be something that is so frustrating for so many people because you really want to consume your indigenous foods, but sometimes you can't find them. And we've talked a lot about how to preserve foods for the winter. So my question to you is, if you don't have access all the time, where and how can you think outside of the box to get access to certain things that maybe are growing outside of your region or things like that? How do you increase access if you're not in your traditional homelands all the time? I think if we, um, the connections that you make with other people, um, the connections that you make with someone from another tribe you know if we're surrounded right by the salt water and don't have access to the fresh water to the rivers more or the lakes then making those connections with other people who are from those tribes or from those areas even non-native people so that we can go and access those areas so we can go and fish in those areas and get that um freshwater fish rather than just a saltwater fish. Um, making those connections so we can go out on the ocean uh, with someone that has a, a big boat to go out there with um, if we're not doing it offshore. Um, so I think that's one way, you know, making those connections with people from other tribes. I have a, a friend that lives upstate and he gathers medicines but he'll travel throughout the state. He'll travel to other states to gather medicine. He'll go to, um, you know, you go to the state parks and national parks or forests and all. So you can go to those places also and seek permission to gather from those places. So I think that's one way that we can um, have more access to what we, we need to gather for our, our traditional foods to continue. Yeah, thank you. Um, Arlene, you're next. So what are some things, so it's easy to fall into like a capitalist mindset where you're going to find something and then take it home, right? And always consume. How do you approach ethical foraging to make sure that you're not overtaking because I remember one of the things about your class is you were teaching us about okay I don't want to pull all the rose petals off of this rose because I need there to be a rose hip later. Do you have any other things like that that you'd like to share? Well in general what we what we practice uh, if you're going to be ethical about this is to only take one third of from that plant from the plants of the area. So like with berries, it's a little bit more flexible, right? But you wanna make sure that enough of those berries fall to the ground to create the seeds to grow new plants, but also to feed the animals. So we go with a one, you harvest one third of what is available, leave two thirds. Um, with, rose, with rose petals, what I've always done is I take two petals per flower so that the scent is still there so that the butterflies so that the bees and those other insects that we need as pollinators are still able to find the flower because those petals are what draws it to that flower okay thank you so sid i know that you do a lot of work to try and increase awareness around working with the buffalo and making sure that people have access. So what is something, like what's something clever that you've done in your work that you wouldn't think of that someone has thought of and you're like, that's it, that's really gonna help people and, and get them either access to buffalo or maybe team sila or any of the things that you taught about in your class? <clears throat> well, knowing I, that here in Denver, Colorado, uh, a lot of our native community don't have access to buffalo meat. And uh, so I 
we uh, actually, I knew that the city of Denver owned two separate buffalo herds here in Denver in their mountain park since, uh, system. One at Lookout Mountain, Genesee Park, and one in Daniels Park. Uh, so we approached uh, the city of Denver and sort of demanded they give our our native people uh, at least one buffalo a year and allow us um, the complete harvest of that buffalo from the taking to the dressing to distribution of it. And we do uh, that in every February, right before uh, we go, we're allowed to go and pick one out that they plan on auctioning off. So we try to take one of the better um, uh, beings that is out there because they do auction their uh, buffalo out once a year with uh, two and three year olds. So we go out there and we pick one out and they we take it out to uh, a piece of property called Tall Bull Memorial Grounds um, that is uh, given to us natives for our ceremonial and social gatherings. And we will uh, uh, honor someone in the community um, with the, uh, the taking, um, the dispatching of that uh, animal. And we will invite community members to come out and uh, different, this being uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho land, we invite the Cheyenne and Arapaho people to come out and discuss uh, their knowledge about taking a buffalo and preparing it and their ways of harvesting it. We, we bring out different people uh, to do that, but, uh, we don't pay for that buffalo. We um, guilted or shamed the city into donating that buffalo to the people of the, the Denver native community. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was uh, uh, pretty good because we don't have to buy it for anyone and they get to have a little bit of meat through some of the year and uh, it, Probably we get about uh, 30 people um, get to take home a real good portion of meat. We try to distribute that to the elders and families in need. But that's one of the things that we did here in the city. Uh -huh. You shamed the, the state of Colorado. <laughs> it was actually the city of Denver who owns those that buff two buffalo herds? So we kind of shamed them into uh, uh, handing over the buffalo, mm -hmm. but uh, it, I thought that was clever enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so true that what everyone has said, but especially Josephine and now Sid, such a salient example of um, being in relationship with other people to get the things that we need. Um, James, could you help us understand, at least for your community, because nobody here speaks for their entire tribe or nation, but just with your community, what are some of the relationships that really keep the food systems going? Yeah, I would love to speak on that. You know, one of the fortunate things about the Pueblo Nation is like, we are, we're all separate Pueblos, tribes, and sovereign nations, but we still honor, you know, the old ways, you know, of trading and practicing like similar cultures and languages. And that's what's been very be like beautiful in terms of relationship building, you know, and building those friendships, you know, like certain tribes have a, certain Pueblo tribes have a, a strength in certain food groups that they har like that they grow and harvest. You know, some tribes have better access to wildlife, you know, for hunting and fishing. And some tribes have better access to farming, you know, just because the land is more fertile and it's closer to the water source. So in our current like 
day of like where we're at with life, you know, our tribes are still honoring those old ways of working and collaborating, building those relationships by having those trading and those relationship like swapping of like certain food groups and meals and access to go fish and hunt in areas that are typically closed for like non-tribal members or or white people you know those those are the those are the type of relationships that my community has built you know from previous engagements and over the years you know just being allies and supporters of one another because the pueblos live very close to one another and share like I said share a lot of very distinctive customs language and practices beliefs so it's very beautiful to see that still be like still being upheld today yeah thank you mm -hmm. so josephine the next question is for you you've taught us about um relationships and trading but you also taught me about how you feel clams with your toes when you're walking on the beach to try and find clams. Um, what are some other interesting gathering methods that you practice? That's basically it. It's going in the water and it's not on the beach. You have to go out in the water during low tide um, and to feel for the, the clams. Um, I think that's probably, you know, one of the main things that we do um, as far as in the waters go. Um, you know, berry picking, you just walk down the road, <laughs> you know, all over the reservation. Like right now, the wine berries, the bramble berries, they're all and, and, um, are, are turning and ready to harvest. I just left someone's house. I dropped off a delivery and and I said, oh, I got to go back there before somebody else goes and gets those berries. <laughs> so, you know, I can go right outside of my door and just, they're right there. Um, so we're, we're blessed as far as gathering. Um, just, we're, we're really blessed. Creator just put us in this place where um, there's so much abundance of, of foods. Um, and I think my grandson just went fishing. <laughs> I saw him go out and grab his pole. So we're, we're really, truly blessed and where we are to just be able to go and gather. Like I said, we live on a peninsula right now. And it, there's so much wildlife. You know, yesterday we counted, we went walking with my granddaughter, and I think there were about 16 turkeys that were out there, you know, the babies, the young ones are, are running with their parents. So we have, we're just blessed here and, and gathering, it's easy sometimes. <laughs> the problem we do have though, is trying to avoid the ticks. So we have to, you know, use its modern chemicals on our clothing or on our skin to try to avoid the ticks. So just make sure you come home and, and get rid of the ticks that, you know, that come on you. You have those moments, I know I do, where you're driving around and you're like, okay, I know if I drive by here in a week, those berries are gonna be ready. That's right. <laughs> Keep tabs on things that are um, ripening around you. Yeah, it's a said, you know, they're, they're all over and just, you know, you see, okay, it, all right, the cherries are starting to get black. So, you know, okay, there's a lot on that cherry tree. So I'll go back and, and gather those or, you know, go check the, um, the beach plums. And they're not quite ripe yet and the grapes aren't ripe yet. So you know when to go and get that. The sumac's not, not ready yet. So you go and, you know, you just see where is there a lot, you know, are there grapes on under those leaves there? No, you know, don't bother going back to that area. Go to another area where you, you see them. And then as the uh, season changes and they ripen, you can just smell them. You know, the, you just walk down the road or you drive by and you can just smell the, the sweetness of them. So, yeah, we like to, to find those. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you one more question, and then once you're done, Arlene, if you could maybe also answer the same question. Um, so my question is, you know, what motivates you to keep 
uh, these old and traditional ways of life? Like, what is your primary, what motivates you to want to learn and to continue to practice these ways? Having learned from my, my relatives, having learned from my grandmother, from my mother, from my aunties, from my uncles, and knowing that it's important to pass that on and, and to learn more. You know, we've had contact for 400 years, since the 1640s, we've had contact. And even prior to that, the, the settlement in our area started by the colonists in 1640. So we've had many, many years of them trying to get rid of us and assimilate us and make us just eat their unhealthy foods. Um, but so it's important that anything we can hold on to and anything we can pass down because that's those things that are healthy for us, those things that will help the health of our children and our grandchildren and those for the generations to come. You know, it's important that we, we learn those things and we hold on to those. Um, I think I say in the last um, session that if we don't hold on to some of these things, the time's going to come. You know, changes are happening in the world all the time. And the time may come that all we have is what creator gave us. And having that knowledge to go out and to gather and to preserve, um, you know, that, that's important that we know what it is we need to look for, you know, when to get it, you know, you know what parts to get. Um, so, and, and what to leave as Arlene spoke before about, you know, don't get the first berries that you see, you know, get it, those things. You have to leave some so more will grow and we have to learn about gathering the seeds and saving those things and trying to help for the, so we don't have all the pollutions and all trying to educate others of what they're destroying with um, over fertilization and, and things like that. So it's just important that, you know, remembering what we've been taught and trying to pass that on to the future. That's why it's important to me. Okay. It's very important for me to follow our traditions because my family was deeply impacted by both the 60s scoop and the residential school. My father was in residential school. My mother was in the 60s scoop, but both found their way back to each other and to our community to meet and get married when they were teenagers. And, but they still were left with this deep shame about who they were. So they wanted to teach us about the foods and they wanted to teach us about some of the things, but they did not want, and, and our family, but they did not want to teach us about anything that might be spiritual because we were raised as um, Mennonite evangelical Christians. They were ashamed of our language, but the food was always that one thing that they felt that couldn't be taken from them the knowledge of the food and it's the knowledge of that food and those food systems that we went through and the gathering and the foraging and the hunting and the fishing and eating those things in the way that we had always eaten them was kind of like a thread that kept us connected to our culture so when they were ready to become more knowledgeable about that we still had that thread that line it was it, our foods were a lifeline to us we spent our entire summers all winters foraging for different things like in the winter with four feet snow drifts and trails we were looking for rabbits you know so we, that's what you would hunt for in the winter 
um, in the fall, it's the mousse. In the summer, it's the berries. Um, during the spring, that's there's a lot of medicines whose roots are perfect for harvesting at that time. And I, I really think that the food is what kept us connected to our land. And because I, I talked about this in my class earlier, that they've learned that scientists have actually learned that touching the land can start to bring healing and calming and so the fact that I was living on the land so much in any time that mom and dad weren't working and doing those kinds of things I think really helped us stay connected so that's why it's important to me. Sid, was there anything that you wanted to add to that that you just kind of thought of? I saw that you unmuted your your audio. And part <laughs> of me wonders if you wanted to add something. But otherwise, I would like to ask you. Um, so when you come across someone, and I definitely have been that person, when they don't understand that they're in relationship with the earth you know and they kind of are operating from a place that's very you know colonized and and they just want to take 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 what do you say to them to remind them that we are in relationship with the earth that we're in reciprocal we're in the natural order as humans um, what do you say to folks like that who are yearning for that connection, but they can't find it? Well, you know, I'm a uh, cultural academics uh, presenter in the school districts around Denver. So I deal with a lot of young native children who grew up in the city and really haven't been exposed to natural uh, environments. So I ask them a simple question a lot of times. I, I ask them multiple questions, but I ask them one question that uh, um, seems to, uh, I guess, boggle their minds. I, I want to say boggle their minds, I, or it, it really brings out their best in them. I asked them, I asked them a lot, um, do you have a knowing of the environment? And just by putting it that way, they're not too sure what I'm talking about. They're like, you mean at school, at home? They, they really become lost and, and, so then I, I turn it around and I say, no, I'm talking about knowing Unchi Maka or Grandmother Earth. Do you know about her and what she provides for us? And then they start to open up a little bit. And then I say, how about other places other than where you live? Do you have any knowledge of going there and living in harmony without disrupting anything and a majority of the kids say that they would love to learn those things that they don't want to harm Unchi Maka or Grandmother Earth and have a knowing of the environments and how to interact properly with them but a majority of the the, the students I talk to in in Denver, sadly, the school districts, whether it's their, their parents because they live in a city, don't have enough time to spend with them out in say uh, the mountains or the prairies or wherever uh, to teach them a whole lot. It, um, it I guess it, it becomes a, a, a difficult thing for those kids to understand or have a knowing of their environments. But I just wanna say, I try to include, I tell them, you know, I'm here to show you and teach you your language, 
your spirituality, your culture, your kinship, indigenous knowledge, and uh, knowing of the environment, because that is who we are as native people. And then they start to get a little excited and, and really ask the questions, the important questions. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I went off topic there, but. No, best I could. That, that was a great answer. Um, it makes me wonder, so James, you just came back from a number of weeks and you were able to grow up as that child with a connection to your land and to your people and you had relatives who took the time to educate you. What are the, the main lessons that you're taking away from the elders in your community about growing and what they see young people as needing to work on in our relationship with the earth, right? Because you hear from mm -hmm. elders were out of balance. You know, mm -hmm. they've been saying the, the things that we're seeing now are coming and like, here they are. So what are you hearing now that you just got home from your home? <laughs> Yeah, so one of the biggest like lessons that I took away, you know, from my childhood, you know, like, I'm, I mean, even to this day, you know, still growing as a young adult is the, is the idea of language, you know, when I was growing up, my grandfather and other local elders, you know, who would come visit will always stress the importance of language, you know, because without language, you know, we can't pray, we can't, we can't practice our dances, our traditional ceremonies our healing prayers you know those are all tied to how we live you know in our everyday lives is through communicating to to the connection of like mother earth and father sky and without language you know like what are we going to do when we have that cornmeal in our hand or tobacco in our hand are we going to send our ancestors a prayer in the foreign tongue you know the the, the language that colonized them you know like to, to me, you know, that's something that I've really taken a lot into deeply into my heart and consideration. Like now that I, I've just gone back, like Desiree stated, you know, from New Mexico and from my community. And when I was down there, you know, I still see that affecting my community a lot today. You know, the, the, gener the, the, the generation after me, you know, they are, they're not seeing that as a, as a huge component to our livelihoods and the way we live as the Pueblo people. They, they're more connected to today's technology, you know, to today's society, what it means, you know, we, we really do believe, my, the people, my community do, do truly believe in the idea of education, you know, the Western knowledge, going out there, getting their degree, setting, setting yourself with a good working foundation. And I think that's what's driving a lot of the youth nowadays is just like, how can I get myself outside of the community and learn to be a doctor, to be a lawyer, to be an engineer. But one of the things that's been really impacting negatively my community is like them not putting that effort into wanting to learn our traditional ways of life as well. And like not learning our language. And like I said earlier, no language connects everything. You know, it connects us to how we pronounce our food, to the wildlife, to our prayers, to our grandmothers, our grandpa, our fathers, our mothers, you know, language is in all of us, you know, and that's something that I've taken a lot growing up and like that's something that I've seen, I'm still seeing today impacting my community very big, you know, the local, the elders now are really trying different mechanisms and strategies to really boost the, the idea for our, for our youth to start learning our language again, you know, because if if we ever come to the to the day, you know, where our language is lost, you know, the local elders say like the system has won, you know, the system that put us on the reservations that have taken our land, you know, decimated our wildlife, you know, our food crops, that system will win once the day our language is lost, as they would say. Yeah, thank you for that. So I'd like to open it up to see if anybody has any questions for our panelists. You've had an entire month of learning from these folks. Do you have any burning questions you'd like to ask? It's nice to see some familiar faces and names coming in for, for question and answer. So I'd just like to open it up and see if anyone has anything to say.
I see you thinking about it. <laughs> okay, well, we'll go ahead and we'll continue with the panel. And then we will have another opportunity for Q&A here if you're thinking about your question, but you haven't formulated it all the way yet. Um, so Josephine, you've heard from James, you've heard from Arlene, you've heard from Sid. Um, there's a lot about the future generations. So what is something that you really want to make sure that you are heard loud and clearly when it comes to our relationship with the earth, when it comes to being ethical, and when it comes to gathering? What could you share with us when you're thinking about like Arlene's little girl that we've seen come in and out of the frame a couple times? Just that I think it's, it's most important that we do, as someone said, that we touch the earth, that we get our children to learn to touch the earth, take your shoes off and run through the grass. You know, if you live in the cities, go to a park. Try to go back to your homeland, wherever your, your people are from, try to go back there and touch the earth there, touch the waters there. Um, you know, I think that is so important that we form that connection and that people and children will see in the future. You know, let them know that wherever they're walking, we're walking on our ancestors. We're walking on the ancestors of, of someone else. If you're not living within your, your traditional territory. And by doing that and, and letting them know who they are, giving that knowledge of kinship. So people and children know, this is how I'm related to this one. This is, you know, your, your per the person that lives near you that you think, is, oh, that's just a neighbor, that's just somebody else's house. No, their great grandmother is your grandmother or you know, things like that, showing that kinship relationship to one another and then showing that kinship relationship to the food, to the earth, to the animals, to the sun, to the moon, and how all of these are all connected. You know, um, teaching about the gifts, you know, when I do talks or when I'm working with the children and you know, I try to say these are all gifts from the creator, the animals, the land, the, the dirt, the rocks, the, the waters, all that, that we have, all. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the most important things to those kinships with humans and with non-human, but everything is living. Mm -hmm. And making all of those connections, I think it's, it's really important that we, that we teach that, that we are all connected, that we are all a gift, and that we need one another to survive. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's a, a very important thing that we need to, to teach. Future. Yeah, thank you for that. That's something that Brooke and I have talked about a number of times because over the course of producing First Foods, it brings up a lot working with the land, working with plants, even the conversations we have, they can be very emotional, you know, and she and I, you know, some weeks ago, we're trying to figure out like, why is this so emotional for us? And it really does go back to, we are so related. So when the land is harmed, we are harmed. Like our ancestors are part of that land, you know? So it's a much um, more tied in cycle that we're in with the land versus just we're standing upon some place. And that's it when you start to grow upon that very land and produce something for your family or grow something for your family. It's, uh, it's far more than just you're growing an onion, 
you know, it's, it's just so much more. Brooke, did you want to speak to that? Um, I think the best way to kind of explain it and what we were talking about before is that, you know, when we talk about things like big words, like um, land acknowledgement, for a non-Indigenous people, land acknowledgement is about acknowledging that you're on a place that you're or ancestrally aren't from. But for us, we have to acknowledge that we are from those places. We are birthed in those places. We're buried there. Our, we make memory there. We laugh. We experience joy, pain, all in the same for thousands of years. And I think it's really hard, especially for settler colonialists or people who function through that um, mentality for them to grasp the amounts of land memory that has established our communities. And so when we're talking about things about like original instructions um, and why I think these programs do get very emotional for us is because it's like, it's involving all the senses, you know, the sight, the taste, the smell, the memory, the, it's literally uniting past, present, and future. It's not just a seed, it's not just a fruit, it's not just leaves, it's, it's really hard, it's like an all-encompassing thing, it is literally our life ways intergenerationally, and so I think what it brings up is the first wound that we have that we are no longer part of a relationship anymore um and i say that as an urban native and as a, a native who's away from my traditional territories uh when i use we i mean that sense not everybody so i think really why it's really deep is we're talking about a wound of extracting us from being human and being in relationship with our earth and relationship with our spirits and our ancestors and you know even with our language systems and how our language wrapped around these concepts of food place and and space and um i think that's where the wound is coming from it's it's that extraction of land and being told that you're no longer part of the earth you know like even having conversations like this, I was thinking about it, it's kind of odd, like what's our relationship or how do we belong to the earth? And I don't think our ancestors would have had that type of, they probably would have felt odd too. Like, what do you mean? I get everything from her. You know, my, my traditional language is about, about five different water spirits and each one provides a different nutrients and a di different source of food. So I think they would have been confused by conversations like this, but we have to have them because colonization did happen. And we were put through forced, through forced assimilation, which removed us from being part of the people. And what that means for me is part of the people that are birthed from a territory that literally the culture grows from that region. So I, I, I'm kind of rambling, but... Um, I think that's what it is. I think that's that wound that everybody's feeling. And the best way I know how to explain, because I think even sometimes language doesn't do that pain justice. Mm -hmm. Any responses to that from our panel? I have one. Okay. When we're talking about the relationships, um, Last week, something hit home really deeply, and that was a white man I knew when I was living in a town nearby was killed by a black bear while he was harvesting blueberries. And it brought me back to this place when I was eight years old. I used to take my little berry pail and go on my bicycle, and I would, my mom would give me a sandwich and a juice box and tell me that she would make something special for me out of the berries that I picked. So I would go off and I would go 10, 12 miles into the, uh, out of town on my bicycle and then walk a mile into my favorite berry patch. And I would just pick there all day until my berry pail was full and then, and eat my sandwich and my 
juice and then go home and she would make me a wonderful pie or something like that. But there was this one time and I saw this bear and it stood up and I was old, so I was much smaller than and I looked at it and it looked what my friend and I just backed up a few feet and walked back to my bicycle and didn't run and that was it and I thought if that bear would go after a man and not me what does that say about the relationships that we need to continue to cultivate with the land it was it was a very powerful thing for me because I love bears I've never been afraid of bears I'm not going to go and try and pet a bear but it, it brought back a very powerful story for me because like I said I was eight years old all, all by myself miles away from anyone and yet that bear did nothing stood up, looked at me, it was about 10 feet away from me. And then it grabbed my ham sandwich and my berries and we all went our separate ways. So I'm a storyteller by nature and that's how I think. So I just wanted to share that story. Mm -hmm. I know I've definitely seen headlines that are like, not dissimilar to the one you just shared. And I thought, is the bear nature defending herself? Is, is that bear, you know, doing the work <laughs> um, to protect the earth, right? So we, we can't ever know, but um, I appreciate your story. What do you think, Sid? James? Any I have a little story, maybe. I'd like to, she, she brought that uh, story up and I have a little story about a buffalo. Uh, I have part interest in a buffalo ranch. And one day they gave us a call, one of the other uh, owners called and said they needed us to come down to the ranch and take care of the matriarch of the herd. She had broke both her front shoulders in, in a shoot while he was trying to move her to another pasture. And as the matriarch of the herd, that buffalo uh, broke her shoulders, she was incapacitated and he tried to get her out on horseback, but the buffalo started attacking him and trying to protect her. Well, he went and got the forklift and he was able to drag her out of the chute, but just a few feet and he was again attacked by the rest of the herd, the bulls and 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 them of the herd attacked him on on the uh, forklift and and pulled out the hydraulic tubing on the forklift and incapacitated the forklift. And he couldn't get very close to her at all. And he really felt very bad that she was suffering and he, he couldn't get himself close enough to help her, whether it was to end, take, end her suffering or, or to see if there was anything he could do. He couldn't do nothing nothing so he called us and it was about 6 p.m in the evening and it was the fall so we loaded up me and another co-owner in a truck and some friends and drove the four hours from denver down to the um, southeastern colorado about 20 miles this side of the oklahoma border about four hours well, we got there and 
he, he said, she's just right there beyond the, the gate. It was here dark. And so we pulled up to the, the gate and as we did, we could see the buffalo standing right there by the gate. So we shined our light and sure enough, they had her surrounded and they were pretty antsy. They were um, mock charging, dunk, uh, stomping their feet and, and, and wouldn't let us close. Well, we decided the best thing we could do would be to sing a, a prayer song about Tatanka, uh, the buffalo, and to say some prayers and to uh, smudge ourselves, let them know that we're, we come to help and not to harm. So we did that and sure enough, they backed off enough that we were able to get inside the gate. And uh, we sang and the other owner went up and uh, before he dispatched the animal, um, and stopped her suffering, the buffalo, as they heard us singing in that, they begun to fight each other instead of coming after us. They backed off about 20 feet or 20 yards, started fighting each other and running around the truck in complete circles around us. And the only means we had was to drag that buffalo in the back of the truck the three of us by hand on uh, on one of the the uh, gate fences we propped it up and drug it up in there and we drove out and proceeded to process that uh, matriarch all night long and about six in the morning when the sun come up we were done we had her loaded up in the back of the truck and we started heading out and there's a road, it's about a, a mile long from the ranch to the main road that you take. As we started um, pulling onto that road, the buffalo lined up along that fence line. And it seemed to me they were saluting their matriarch. So that was my understanding uh, of those buffalo that there is a kinship that we have with other beings, with Unchi Maka, with Grandmother Earth, that belongs to us as native people, that derives from our DNA that has been given to us by creation for having the knowing of the of Unchi Maka and the environments and our relationship to the great mystery the Waha Tanka. And having that all said, those buffalo, I felt like they saluted us and her at the same time as they lined up a hundred head, sticking their heads over the fence, watching us leave the property. It was quite the powerful feeling. But that story she told about the bear reminded me of that time down at the ranch. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sid, for sharing that. Um, James, where your family lives, is that the nature of other animals that are around, or does that seem specific to the buffalo? Have you ever heard of anything like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, are the, the geographic location where my community and my people live, you know, was not it's more suitable for like the wild game such as deer, elk, bighorn, you know, and then some fishing. We are located right along the banks of the Rio Grande River, you know. We do have those connections with those type of wildlife, you know, when the men go out do during hunting season, you know, they've we've had stories of different altercations and different times where men have come across wildlife and they've they've like folk like how can I say this I'm trying to find the perfect transition in English that they've communicated in a way you know that they read each other's minds to say like I'm here you know I'm I want to pay respect to you you know 
I've come to harvest you to feed the people, but then the people are going to remember you and honor you by having a gathering of everyone coming together. So those type of communications and dialogues have been very, is very rich in the culture and the community. Even though like my community doesn't have, never really had any buffalo, you know, roaming freely before, we still honor that as a, them as a sacred, sacred animal to other tribes, especially on the Northern Plains. We have our own, very own like buffalo songs and dances that the Pueblo takes on, you know, every winter right before the, the grass starts to turn green, you know, the snow starts to, is starting to melt. That's the time, you know, when the Pueblo start to really honor the, the spring or life coming back to it, you know, with the, with the calving of new, newborns to, to the bison, to the deer, to the elk, you know, that's kind of like our period of time where we do have those honorary ceremonies and dances that take place. And our, like just remembering our connection to, to the earth, to the sky, you know, to the wind, to the rain, to the snow, all these natural elements that have a voice as well, you know, that we are all in relation, we're all interconnected somehow with the same, with the same life cycle as is, you know? Yeah, I, that makes me think about, you know, I was always taught that if there are certain plants that are growing around where you live, especially if you live in a home where you have access, but plants also place themselves which I also um, need to talk with my relatives about animals, but they will place themselves closer to you, right? So you mm -hmm. look for what medicines and what plants grow around you. Mm -hmm. like you are thought of just as you're thinking of them in the same way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally. You know, like I, we, we value and we understand, you know, that you know, it's not just us, you know, like natural world has its own way of going about, you know, with its life, you know, we understand that, like, even though if we're like thinking, you know, like, hey, we're struggling for food, you know, like, we, we can't afford this, you know, a wildlife could come and like, just like, end up, what do you call it, like, giving itself up, you know, like, here, I'm here to feed you, you know, I'm, I hear you're having a hard time feeding your children, your elders, I am here to help you through these hard times. And those are the, those are the types of relationships, you know, that we, we hear about and we see in the, in our community. Mm -hmm. I definitely mm -hmm. have a story from my grandpa that he <laughs> tells about him and his brother were just because um, they didn't have a lot of money and him and his brother were crying because they were hungry and his mom didn't really know what to do. And it was one of those stories that he told me over and over and over again, as mm -hmm. you know, an 84 year old might often do. Um, but his dad like burst through the door and he had been able to catch a deer. And he mm -hmm. talked about these deer steaks after being so hungry, his dad mm -hmm. picked up some just fat deer steaks. And they, nice. and he talked about how his belly was just so full. Mm -hmm. So I definitely can hear, you know, at least with Miwok people where we have the same kind of stories because his dad had been praying, like, we need help, mm -hmm. help. And so it was like right in that moment where they were just so hungry, like, here's this deer mm -hmm. to save their life, you know? Yep. Mm -hmm. So, well, we have about 15 minutes left and we have a whole bunch of people on this class does anyone want to make a comment or share some thoughts um am i on <laughs> you are oh um good evening everybody uh yakiski milam teko here uh yaki Pecha, tarahumana and mexica here um i just had a question um what we were what I was listening to earlier was incredibly impressive in regards to, you know, the land and our people and how we're connected to it and so on and so forth. Do you think the fact that the vast majority of us indigenous people, you know, the fact that we have suffered through 500 years of colonialism, do you think that our overall lack of connection to said land is a result of that ongoing trauma? or generational trauma 
if you will. Would that be like a piece of it or am I just ram rambling off? I think absolutely that um, that trauma plays a role because when, when you've had, especially like I said, we've had 400 years of contact and that trying to remove a people from their connection that that takes it away. When people went off to boarding schools, you know, we had some people that went to boarding schools and also, and talking to some of their younger relatives, you know, they say, well, they'll say, I'm Shinnecock, but I'm not, you know, they, they right. don't feel of themselves as the same way. They don't feel some of that same connection mm -hmm. um, because that was, you know, you weren't supposed to be that way anymore. You were just supposed to be this modern person. You had to learn the ways of farming you know, the ways of making lace or whatever, or the ways of fixing cars. So that removed people from that connection to the oh. earth, to each other, to those relationships that we talked about. So I think that definitely that's part of that trauma. And then we went from, from that to you know, everything being more industrialized again and again. And then now we're in this modern technology era. And like right. you know, someone said, the kids are all, you know, they rather be on their iPhones and iPads, some of them, than be out going right. in the like, waters and all. Right, like I was as a kid where I would run out and play with, play with my friends, you know, whenever rain, Whenever my sister and I would visit our relatives, we'd go down to the lake or we would try and hunt rabbit or fish or, you know, yeah, um, it's an absolute travesty. And I do thank you very, very much, Joseph, Josephine, and thanks to each and every single one of you. Um, you all have an excellent evening. It has been an, it has been a, both an, an honor and a privilege to be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your, um, your comments as always. We love having you um, join the class. Does anyone have any other questions or comments? Otherwise, Brooke, I don't know if you want to tell them, but we have a giveaway. Yeah, we do. If there's uh, no other questions or comments and giveaways, but I just want to, before we get into that, I just want to, again, thank all the panelists. Thank you, Yao. I think it's really important to constantly talk about, um, it's okay to talk about traumas and wounds and stuff like that, because it just lets us know the direction we need to go, right? So if we know that we've been removed, uh, largely as Indigenous people, from having access towards our, our lands and its totality, then we know where to move. You know, so once we're able to say, okay, this is what's hurting, then we can go and get that ceremony. We can go and get that medicine that we need. So I just want to thank you for bringing that up and, um, you know, recentering that back on having relationship with the earth for indigenous people is always going to go back to access to lands, to um, rectifying and rematriating and, and, and kind of re you know, reestablishing land back in many ways and um, really pinpointing and looking settler colonialism in the face and saying no more. You know, this wound is too big, it's too deep and my children will not, um, they're not gonna know those pains anymore. So I just wanted to thank him for bringing up that topic and thanking all the teachers that we have here. But. If nobody else has questions or comments or anything like that, we can definitely get into the giveaways. Um, just Brooke, you know, you just said about the trauma and I think that we have to start that healing. You know, that's our focus now is that healing, is using the land, the waters, the animals for our healing. And if you are stuck in the city you know, go to a zoo, go to a game farm, go to a park, just look out your window and watch the birds, just watch what they're doing. You know, just use 
use all these gifts, use nature, use these as things of healing. You know, the, the things we can access, we will access. If we have to go to a health food store and, and ask about the certain plants, or the medicines that they have in the health food stores to heal us, but that were, you know, are from natural things, remembering those things and, and helping to heal. Um, here on a reservation, we've started a, um, you know, we started instead of saying reservation, we're saying territory. You know, we're cha change the mindset. Um, go in the waters. We're doing echotherapy. We have people who are doing echotherapy. We're having the community gardens. We're having the, um, someone's bringing rescue horses for the people to, to work with. Um, so it's healing the horses. It's healing the people. It's healing the children. Um, to get past some of these traumas and the, the substance abuse and all. So, you know, let's just keep using our foods and our medicines for, for that healing, using the earth for healing. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you for those words, you know, especially for, for myself, you know, living in the urban city area here in Colorado, you know, it's been very difficult to be able to have access to, to the certain things that are free in this world, you know, like the, like the wind, the outdoors, the water, and then going to go see animals and such, you know, praying with them, you know, just having that access has been pretty limited, you know, so thank you for those words. I do appreciate you bringing that up. It is time to start healing, you know, healing ourselves healing our people healing our land you know uh everything that we're connected to so i just want to like give another thank you for that you're welcome uh i have something to add speaking of trauma uh last week uh we were discussing healthy foods and i had a vegan lady tell me that no people could be healthy that relied on meat as their main substance. And when she told me that, that really kind of triggered me because I know my people, the Lakota people, uh, relied on the buffalo and, and that was probably 75% of the foods that they relied on was buffalo, all the different parts of it, and it was meat. And I, I told her, while well, my people, we hunted buffalo for millennia and ate the buffalo for as long as the sun rose and the grass grows. And she, uh, she really had no comprehension that a people could live as a hunter gatherer. And she thought that everyone should become a vegan in order to become healthier. But in my own mind, I'm thinking that's not who we are or I am as a Lakota person who, who knows that our people survived off of that buffalo entirely. So I was really uh, triggered by that, that little thing that this uh, vegan lady was trying to tell me that uh, all people should become vegans. So sometimes we really have to know where we come from and, and even face that trauma in order to, to uh, get to some of the uh, right answers that we're seeking. For me, one thing that I've been noticing is scientists have already started to figure out what we as Aboriginal people have known forever, which is everything has feelings. They've started figuring out that plants have feelings. That's why when we harvest, we harvest correctly and sensitively. You don't take everything from 
one place. You don't, you respect and thank everything that has sacrificed itself to feed your family. Um, it's not only the animals that feel pain. So I think that that's one thing that we really have to remember that what, however we eat, and I eat meat, I especially love to have game and fish, but however we eat, we're part of the cycle of life and something sacrificed itself for us to continue to be here. Thank you. I just want to thank you guys all for the for that perspective because I think it's a perspective that isn't mainstream unfortunately because mm -hmm. us as native people deal with high erasure and invisibility on a daily and I think it's really important especially to non-native audiences that may be watching this or if you watch this later on to understand that our cultures developed from the lands so take for example Sid's people having high amounts of monoculture agriculture would ruin the plains but if you follow the buffalo and you take some and you you do with with proper pro protocol and you know with respect as Sid has showed you it's and, and and Josephine and Arlene and James our cultures come from the territories we are birthed from so when we eat certain ways, it's not harmful. It doesn't create a negative impact on the environment. What creates a negative impact on the environment is when you take um, foreign food consumption and food culture and bring it into those spaces and then force it to be that way. So for example, let's say take avocado. Avocado single-handedly by the vegan movement has caused massive droughts because you are forcing a plant to overproduce that is not from certain territories. And you're saying, I need you to grow bigger and more robust, and I need you to multiply as much as you can instead of eating with relationship to the land. And I think that that's what's really important about each one of our, our teachers tonight is that they're all able to show that our culture literally is, um, it is the instruction of the land how to eat, how not to eat, when to do things, um, when to pray, when to have ceremony, when to gather, when to harvest, when to follow the buffalo, when to not, you know. So I just want to thank everybody for that perspective. It's really important, I think. And if there's nothing left, then I guess we should be getting to the giveaway soon because we are hitting towards the uh, ending of the class, the panel. Hey, okay, you want to tell them what's up with this big time giveaway? Okay, so we have five winners that we're going to be um, giving out Tonka bars to. So each winner would be getting a box of Tonka bars. Yeah, look at Sid's face. <laughs> so our first winner. Oh, right, here we go. Here we go. Rosetta Walker. Oh, she's on this call. Great. She's on it. Oh, I was on it here. And Dave, and Dave Riong, this is our second winner. <laughs> Ganu Benton, third winner. Canyon. Okay, Ann Sayers. Scott Lipoca, our last finalist. And if anybody's interested in purchasing or donating to the Tonka Fund or buying a Tonka bar, you you didn't get to win today, you can uh, go on the website and check them out. Hey, good job on that giveaway and the graphics, the commercials. <laughs> you amaze me. She made that. Isn't that good? That's <laughs> <It's> so funny. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much to everybody, all the people who tuned in um, on the Zoom and also in our class. So this is the last first food that's going to be on a Thursday. We're moving it on over to Wednesday so that we can be in good relationship and not have overlapping programming with a different um, community group. So we're moving to Wednesday. That starts. Brooke has been tirelessly working on a really amazing 
set of um, teachers coming up. We're going to be uh, doing a theme of what is it feeding motherhood. So we've got yeah, so the the theme for the month is um, breast food breast milk as food sovereignty. And the first class is feeding motherhood teas tinctures and bone broth. Uh, our second class is going to be breast care and lactation. And then our third class is birth as ceremony, postpartum, and um, prenatal care. So I'm really excited about that, about discussing first foods with uh, indigenous breast milk. <laughs> also, just something to know, uh, I think it's tomorrow, there is a Cherokee chef named Chef Carice, who on the Ibex Puppetry Facebook page, uh, you can watch her it's a cooking class where she's making, they're like an empanada with buffalo meat and blue potatoes and strawberry drink, which she makes. Oh my gosh. So if you might want to tune in, that's something to do. Um, I need, I really need to stop doing first foods before dinner because I come away always so hungry. But, um, yeah, so thank you everybody for tuning in and uh, thank you to all of our instructors. You all are amazing and inspiring and so appreciate it. So. Have a good day and be well. Catch you on Wednesday next week. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Thank you. I'll see you again. Bye now. Nice meeting you.